we are live. Welcome to Star Wars Episode 3, Review and Thoughts, Revenge of the Sith film. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, another trilogy ends in disappointment. Despite excellent political commentary, some truly talented acting, and a strong focus on the core conflict between the Jedi and Palpatine, strengthened by fairly compelling interpersonal relationships. I am way too young to be getting too old for this Sith. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise including ones released before this, so not only Episodes 1 and 2, but also 4 through 6. Not Clone Wars, haven't watched it yet. But as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie and, again, Episodes 1 and 2. Yeah, spoilers for the six episodes George Lucas was involved with. And... Here we go. So there are several major appeals of comic books, adaptations of them, and similar. Technically, Star Wars isn't directly, you know, they, comic books and Star Wars have similar inspirations. Let's, let's go with that. One of them is that get, they can have many wild concepts and have them play off each other. Magic Power versus Robots, for example outside of comics and their adaptations and stuff similar. You'll only have a few at a time, and yeah, this one does that. And another major appeal with their wild concept, they can give compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency than non-comic stuff. And yeah, this also does that with the political, you know, you don't have the baggage of, like, there's, there's a lot about pa Palpatine that's similar to, to Hitler. But if you just did a story about, you know, when when you... I've, I've seen people criticize, for example, biopics of Hitler by saying, well, of course it happened back then, that doesn't mean it'll happen now. And certainly it could only happen in Europe, it couldn't happen in America. But then when you make a movie like this, you know, you can, yeah, no, no, none of the baggage. So, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features the following, and I am going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering cons content. Torture. Let's see. Abuse gaslighting, mental illness, murder, body horror, the powerful abusing their power, and genocide. Now, right, also please note that I have a tendency to sometimes when I'm discussing a sensitive subject use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider negative. So if I say something that sounds judgmental, it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive, not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. And I will do my best to pronounce the names correctly. If I get it wrong, it's not that I'm intentionally making fun of them. So the movie's rated PG-13, so is this video 
This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I streamed this, so, you know, thus didn't have to pay extra to watch it. So anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it or I was expecting the trailers and other marketing other movies in the same franchise I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it to the best of my ability and the negative things I said in this are for criticisms based on budget when it came out what it was trying to achieve etc so in a lot of ways this is like the you know episodes one and two so I'm not gonna mention all the things where they're similar I'm gonna talk about the ways that they're different from one another so I'm not just repeating myself and quite logically you will need to have watched episodes one and two in order to follow this I recommend watching episodes four through six before watching any of the prequels because of things that the prequels give away that otherwise are you know compelling discoveries in the original trilogy now since we're still dealing with corona I want to say during this video it's possible that I will touch my face I want to assure you I washed my hands since the last time I was outside and I will wash my hands again before going out so the I base this this review on the Disney Plus version. I have also watched the DVD version, and I watched it in theaters when it first came out. And yeah, by now I must have watched this several dozens of times. I three dozen maybe. And let's see. It occurred to me recently that some people might think that. You know, I've I've simply I've watched it so many times that I just no longer, you know, I ca I can't watch it as if it was the first time again. So, you know, that's why I have a negative opinion. But I've also watched episodes four and five dozens of times, and those I still love. You know, when even though I like when it, yeah when I watched episode yeah. When I watched episodes four and five for, you know, the, the same days that I did those videos, I really got, I got completely sucked into them, even though I knew every single thing that was happening. Like, it wasn't, there wasn't anything new in there that, did, I, I suppose, tiny changes for the, you know, I hadn't watched the Disney Plus versions before, but, you know, nothing, nothing that completely changed what the movie, what the movies were like. And even though I had just watched them, I went ahead and watched, you know, right, right, like the couple of days before I watched episode five for doing a video on that. I rewatched episode four, even though it had been like two or three weeks since I last watched it. And I did the same thing with, you know, when I watched episode six, I rewatched episode five and yet still really got into it. And, you know, I haven't gone back and rewatched one of these since then because I just don't. I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't feel that kind of, yeah, I, I just can't get into these, you know, episodes one through three and episode six. I can't get into them the way that I can get into episodes four and five. There's just, there are too many problems with these four that either aren't there in those two or just are overpowered by all the good qualities now let's see. right plot it has been several years of clone wars the republic clone army continues to get closer to the separatists but it appears that palpatine is almost completely ready to go through the last steps of his master plan that's right three movies into the trilogy and finally there is in fact a Star Wars something that there was from the very start of the original trilogy and the at, at the very start yeah 
Let's see, how much should I give away since this is the non-spoiler section? It starts with a really epic battle. That's what I will say. Um, right, others have pointed out this movie feels more like a Star Wars movie than Episodes 1 and 2, and that's definitely true. I would say the first 25 minutes, you, you know, in addition to it feeling a lot like a Star Wars movie, you can really tell this is what George Lucas wants to be able to do with these movies. You know, this is the... It's, that's the, the scope and the tone and the just that level of unpredictability is, yeah. So the writing is handled by George Lucas and, you know, the, the stuff that I've seen that he's written, in addition to all six of the Star Wars movies he wrote, I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark, American Graffiti, and THX 1138. more holes in the overall canon exist from what is seen and heard in this. This does try to, and to some extent su succeeds, in bridging the gap. The efforts do range between abruptly sudden and too slow, but the middle is reached, at least for portions. And... Uh, yeah, again, George Lucas had way too many yes-men around him. And he clearly did not have the entire, you know, all six movies in his mind while worse, whilst working on any of his individual films. And what, once again, you know, I didn't grow up with the original trilogy. I didn't experience a lot of hype for... You know, like, episodes one through three, when they first came out, I was excited, but I didn't think, it, you know, it wasn't like, oh, this is going to change the world. I was, you know, they looked like fun movies, but they, yeah. So it's not that I'm coming into it with this kind of, yeah. So the, the plot twists... I don't think there are too many, but some of them are definitely bad. And at the end of the day, I would say too many of them... Like, if you watched episodes 4 through 6, and again, I would definitely say, like, you you get way more out of these... of the prequel trilogy if you already watched the original trilogy first. I... Again, when I first, let's see, I think I did watch the original trilogy before watching the prequel trilogy, but I didn't really remember that much of it. And then I went back afterwards and rewatched the original trilogy. And then when the next time I rewatched the prequels, I, you know, I, I way more appreciate it. Like, in the original trilogy, you see what the the what the Star Wars galaxy looks like when there is really no you know yeah with, without democracy, and then you watch the prequels and you see democracy, and you really appreciate how much the democracy meant when you've already watched the movies that. Yeah, where there was none. So, yeah, the, the, or not none, but it didn't, the, there was more fascism in the Star Wars galaxy than democracy, and, and the fascism was more powerful in the original trilogy. Now... And I do, th you know, yeah, so I realize, you know, it being a prequel, if you've watched the original trilogy, 
you know what's in those, so I, you know, I get that some might say, oh, then how could this surprise? But there are some things that surprise. And I think there could have been more, and they could have been better handled, the ones that were. And yeah, so directed by George Lucas, and I've watched all four Star Wars movies he's directed, and American Graffiti, and THX 1138. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, this entire movie was shot on the Sony HDC F950 high-definition camera using Sony's HDCam SR digital video format. And... Let's see, um, right, and while shooting key dramatic scenes, George Lucas would often use an A camera and B camera, or the V technique, a process that involves shooting with two or more cameras at the same time in order to gain several angles of the same performance. And using the HD technology developed for the movie, the filmmakers were able to send footage to the editors the same day it was shot, a process that would require 24 hours had it been shot on film. And I, you know, I, I would say that that definitely made a difference in some ways good, in some ways bad. Some of the movie moves so fast because they, you know, they're they're making it so fast. They don't really stop to think about, you know, some scenes will just convey some important information and then very quickly end. You know, also because there is so much to 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 get to. There's so much material that George Lucas wanted to make sure, you know, because basically he said this is it. When I've made episode three, I am not going to make another movie that is set between episodes three and four. And because of that, there's just, there's so much material in this movie that should have been spread out over the the other movies that, you know, the... the in, in this movie, Anakin starts to really fall to the dark side it's, it's not a spoiler. It starts very, very early on. And again, you should have watched episodes 4 through 6 before this, so you already know that Anakin Skywalker has turned to the dark side by episode 4. And I'm not the first person to point out that basically the, the turn to the dark side should have started in movie 1. You know, I, I just watched, I want to say his YouTube channel, it's called Center Row. He did a video talking about the problems with prequels in general and how to fix the Star Wars prequels in particular and both are excellent videos and yeah he points out it should have started much sooner it should not have been in it should not have started in the third movie because it just does not it it the movie's in way too much of a rush now the opening is is very it it's some of the best of of the movie is the the very opening now i'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad but it does fit with what came before i would say the ending a lot about the ending works there is not deus ex machina other convenient writing Now, something I try to go into in these reviews is whether the movie loses your interest along the way. I would definitely say there are parts of this movie where you really don't, like, there's just, there are scenes that really don't need to be there. It, you know, they're, they're there because George Lucas wanted to show something like that in a movie or he felt like it was necessary to put the information in there to help bridge the gap between trilogies. Now, the use of force powers can be quite fun in the movie. So the the characters Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi. This is the the closest, you know, that McGregor is to, to playing the Alec Guinness version 
of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And it's incredible how much he resembles him, and without it just feeling like imitation or even worse, parody. And yeah, it's it's really great. Like, Ewan McGregor does consistently give some of the best performance performances in these in the in the prequels. You know, the, there are tons of talented actors in the prequels that, you know, frequently because of bad material or George Lucas not being that great of a of an actor's director just yeah you know because of the those factors they don't give particularly strong performances I would say Natalie Portman does give some quite you know her, her performance is Padma Amidala I was gonna say Actually, yeah, now that I think about it, fairly consistently in this one, you know, there's there's very little, there, yeah, there is a tiny bit left of the romantic dialogue, and that is still just, it, it just does not work. Like, you can tell that the actors don't completely feel comfortable with the lines, they may not completely believe what they're saying, but the other scenes, you know, she's, the, the, She's very devoted to Anakin, and basically, you know, and yeah, and, and she's worried about how democracy can, you know, can survive the, you know, this, this war and all the extra powers that Palpatine has gotten because of the war. And yeah, she's she gives a really strong performance. The the best of that she gives in these three. And Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. And you know the the also his best work in in the prequels. He's he does a really good job both in scenes where he's where we can understand like he he worries about the the he he is worried himself about falling to the dark side he is worried about losing control and he does a a quite good job like there are times where you can really see this this tension in him between letting go and the the worries and yeah when when he's with Padme and they're smiling and happy together and when he's more like dark there's some really good stuff in his performance and Ian McDermott as Palpatine slash Darth Sidious It's really great to behold him doing the iconic voice and the the kind of you know in in the in episodes one and two when he plays Sidious he'll do the voice and and such but a lot of the time he is just yeah he's playing this this kind senator but in this he really gets to just let loose and it's just it's glorious the the sometimes he'll talk very gradually as if every word is a delicious bite into a dessert and he wants to enjoy every single word and you know the and and he'll do the 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 threatening just I can't do it justice so I'm not gonna try to imitate it but just yeah he's 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 incredibly good and he he has he has fun and we have fun and I am going to. 
Right. There is... Oh, great. There's this deleted scene where Anakin and Obi-Wan are surrounded by droids, and they end up man outmaneuvering the... you know, getting out of the situation. But before that, we see them using these gestures to suggest to each other what maneuver to use. I think an argument could be made that it it goes on for at least a little bit too long, but beyond that, it is a good idea. It shows that they're good Jedi, good friends. Not They don't always agree on everything, and the movie does also show this, and there's entirely too little of that in Episodes 1 through 3. I feel like by the time Lucas was making this movie, he suddenly remembered, oh, right, Alec Guinness's Obi-Wan Kenobi said that Anakin Skywalker was a good friend of his, so maybe I should actually show that. This has some of the best acting in a Star Wars movie written by George Lucas, and it is in fact done by Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman. The bad news is it's a scene with no dialogue where they're not in the same room. That's a bad sign. In, actually, in general, Hayden Christensen gives a great performance when he isn't delivering bad dialogue. Some of his best moments legitimately is, like, when he just is emoting with his face. When, when he doesn't have to deliver a line, and it's just his face, maybe especially his eyes, very strong performance. And... I think that the cameos often detract rather than add, detract from the movie rather than adding to it. According to IMDb Trivia, Francis Ford Coppola suggested Christopher Neal to George Lucas to be the dialogue coach. Lucas said that given the emotional intensity of this movie and the fact that he rarely has time to converse with the actors and actresses, it would be ideal for someone else to be there to get the strongest performances possible. Neil is, in fact, Coppola's nephew, and his father, Bill Neal, brother to Eleanor Coppola, worked for Industrial Light and Magic during the production of the original trilogy. I think the the work of Christopher Neal is, you know, can, can help explain why some of the performances in this are much better than in Episodes 1 and 2. I, I wish that Lucas had gotten that bit of advice before Episode 1 before making episode one. Some of the very worst of George's dialogue is found in this one. And early on in the movie, Anakin and Obi-Wan have too many witty lines. Obi-Wan has too many one-liners in the movie in general. And they're not even particularly good Now, the cinematography was handled by David Tattersall, and he also DP'd Speed Racer, Next, and Con Air. Now, not everybody thinks that those are the best movies ever made. I love Con Air, but the other two, wow. But they are shot well, and he does a really great job in this as well. The cinematography, other than the, the busy CGI, you know, shots, it is largely easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes, and the movie does not have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. And... Yeah, quoting some fellow critics here, marvelous cinematography, and right, the the technically the following is arguably a spoiler. So yeah, spoiler for the early part of this movie. 
The first movie in the series in 1977 one did introduce something new in effects, the dogfight and trench room at the end. Since then, effects laden films have learned how to place and move the camera in new and exciting places. Even a film as mundane as Unleashed which I saw last week, moved the camera into the midst of the fight scenes. Lucas' camera is still stuck in the same mode as in 1977, which he admittedly stole from Kurosawa. That is, except for the first seven minutes or so. That is the only part of the whole movie where we see a new camera eye. This is De Palma's eye. It follows the fighters and their pilots, it swings around them and precedes them, it swings to their point of view, it moves back out of the battle and back in. But shortly, uh, shortly we are back in the old static green screen mode with Jackson. No more spoilers for the time being. Colorful rocket ride for moviegoers who just want a good time on Saturday night. It's a big, splashy picture. It's constructed much like an old school comic book. Each frame is full of some sort of vibrant or loud color. Even the darker tones stand out. And each image is meticulously created, crafted, so that every centimeter of the screen is filled with some little bit of importance. And the editing was handled by Ben Burt, who also edited episodes 1 and 2. Roger Barton, who also edited Terminator Genesis, the A-Team movie Speed Racer, Amityville Horror Remake, Bad Boys 2, Ghost Ship, Pearl Harbor, and he was part of the, he was additional editor and associate editor on The Island, Armageddon, and Titanic. And the editing very frequently keeps it easy to follow fast moving scenes like action scenes, and it definitely does keep more calm when that is called for. Now, there are some scenes that should be trimmed or even cut, especially the stuff that's just bridging the gap or is basically there because the, like, George Lucas was worried that some audiences would get bored if there wasn't enough action scenes. And, yeah, there are some parts of the movie that are legitimately very effectively edited, especially ones that don't feel like we've seen them or, yeah, ones that that are very unlike what we've seen in other parts of George Lucas' Star Wars saga. And that is, like, if you're going to make another one of these movies, you should have something to show us that we haven't seen before. Now, yeah, parts of the movie just feel like they only exist to close the gap between the two trilogies. It doesn't make for very compelling watching. There are one or two things that George Lucas meant to put in the movie to help close the gap, but they ended up as just deleted scenes. And if you don't know that, the, you know, you, yeah, if you don't know that there are those deleted scenes, and you didn't already hear of it, you probably didn't realize that that stuff was going to be in the movie. It doesn't feel like it's missing. And, you know, fair enough, that, that maybe means that it should already have been, that it was the right decision to cut it. But I do also think that it helps prove that it really wasn't necessary to do this much to close the gap. There are 19 years between the events of this movie and the events of episode 4. A lot can happen in that time. We don't need to see every single thing. Now, these special effects are some of the best of the, the prequels. And, you know, sadly it's still this... I would say the worst part of the effect is how busy some parts are. There are there are parts where like something important will be going on in the scene itself, but in addition to that, like the camera will be in an angle where you can look out a window and outside of the window there's something huge going on also and it just it makes it much more difficult to focus. Now, the budget was $113 million, and the box office was $868.4 million. Now, the locations used include 
Switzerland, Italy, Thailand, Tunisia, and China. So they got some really great, very varied locations and yeah, they, they did some really great work there, finding some really great locations and getting these, like, very distinct, very different from each other flavors. You know, these, at, at the best, when the movie is at its best, it feels like you're looking at a real place where people could actually live and work. It doesn't feel like some... What's the word? It doesn't feel like a set. It doesn't feel artificial. Now the according to IMDb, there's there's something in this movie that is sometimes referred to as Mon Calamari opera, and according to IMDb, during production, the Mon Calamari opera was nicknamed Squid Lake, like Swan Lake, but something that lives under water. Yeah, that's that's pretty funny. Now, the the biggest war scenes of the six George Lucas Star Wars movies appear in this. And yeah, the action can just be really frenetic and really really over the top. And, yeah, the, the lightsaber action varies, but some parts, with how casual the people wielding lightsabers are, you know, I, th I think the intent was to make it look cool, but it just takes away the sense of danger, the thrill and excitement. And a lot of action scenes are done in medium shot, you know, either medium shots or close-ups, which makes it really difficult to yeah add to that and a number of battle scenes and I would say it's the only time in any of the the six George Lucas movies the battle scenes lack a sense of progression you can you can't tell who's winning there, there's a little bit of that going on in Attack of the Clones yes but it's it's much more frequent here and, yeah, you know, the battle scenes end up as little more than visual spectacles. Like, they're there to keep the the more impressionable audience members, like, excited. Because they're, they're seeing, you know, it's, it's moving so fast, and it's so loud, and there's so much, and it's so colorful, and all this stuff. And just, yeah, it, it, it doesn't get to you the way that the battle scenes in episodes 4 and 5 do. Now... Let's see... Honestly, it feels like the... Oh! Hold on, there was something there. Let's see. Really depicting the war as being tense is ridiculous because we already know that the Chancellor is playing both sides and we know who lives and dies since we've seen episodes 4 through 6. And You know, I, I would argue that it would have been much more compelling if Attack of the Clones had ended with the Chancellor losing control of the Separatists, so that it really was two sides fighting each other. Honestly, I would say the the battle scenes in the movie, it feels like they exist primarily to sell Star Wars Battlefront to the, the old one, the, I want to say 2000, yeah, it must have been 2005 where you get to fight on I would say every single battlefield nearly every single battlefield that the movie depicts 
you know, so not all not always under the same exact circumstances, but yeah, you know, and and the nearly all the same vehicles and the same like troops and and such and yeah, you know, fair enough. If if that was the what they were hoping for, they they got there, but they didn't get any further than that. Like, don't get me wrong, I've spent quite a few dozens of hours playing that game, and it, I, th I think it, it wasn't on this viewing, it was on the, the last viewing, when I sat down to watch episode 3, so I want to say it was in 2017, you know, so four years ago, I sat down to watch this, having recently watched episodes 1 and 2, which I remembered a lot of. I didn't really remember a lot of this, and then I sat down and watched it, and I was like, wow, this is just kind of, this, this is a video, uh, video demo, basically. This is, this is there to, to get me excited about playing the video game, because I remember those places way more from the video games, and that's not true of, like, I've also spent countless hours playing Enter the Matrix, and in that game you also go to some places that are important to the Matrix movies, but I remember them from both the game and the movies, you know, that's how it's supposed to be, it's supposed to get you engaged, you know, there's there's also a lot of places in, in the Star Wars Battlefront games that are from the original trilogy, and I, again, I remember those from both those movies and that game. I can't believe George Lucas finally gave us a planet full of Wookiees as he had originally wanted to do in Return of the Jedi, even did it in the third movie in the trilogy, and I barely cared during the scene. So much moves so fast, and a lot of the CGI lacks weight and grit, so it's hard to get involved. It just does not feel real. It's too effortless. You know, for this movie, it doesn't feel that different whether you've watched five minutes, 30 minutes, two hours, or anywhere in between. You know, I'll, I'll grant that if you've bought, if you haven't watched at least around five minutes, yeah, you know, it, it feels different to watch five minutes of this movie than to be doing something completely different. But, like, I could sit down and watch the last five minutes, or I could sit down and watch the first five minutes, and I would not feel that differently about it. And, again, like, yeah, like, hypothetically, if, let's say the multiverse exists, and in one one universe of the multiverse, I stop watching five minutes in. In another, I watch the entire movie. If the if those two me's cross over and and try to you know engage, talk about the movie, they're not going to be that differently. They're not going to feel that differently about it. So the action includes chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights shooting including shooting while in vehicles the, you know this by far has the most vehicle action scenes of the the six Lucas Star Wars movies and it is impressive lightsaber action which moves extremely fast I've seen others say it looks like a dance and I agree I just don't think that's a good thing I think it should look like a struggle it should be visceral don't get me wrong it's definitely impressive they clearly spent forever practicing in order to be able to do that do it that fast and use of force powers and such. Okay, and that brings us to the score by John Williams, who has scored every all, all nine of the Star Wars episodes and the yeah you know his, his score is excellent yet again you know the if there if there is only one thing that you can truly depend on in a George Lucas Star Wars movie, it is that the score will always be excellent, no matter what other things. Yeah. 
and the sound design again has some really great stuff. I will say I'm not the first one to point it out, but there's this there's this giant iguana creature and it emits this noise that's really uncomfortable to listen to and they just they they should have toned that down. It's not a uh, huge. It doesn't appear in that much of the movie, but it's it's bad when it's there. It's very bad when it's there. Now, this one doesn't have way too much comic relief. It's closer to the original trilogy in finding a good balance and not being too aggressive with the comic relief, with a couple of exceptions. For sure, like, there's some stuff with R2-D2 and other droids that's... Yeah. I, I, get, I get having something in there for the kids to laugh at. But it doesn't have to be, like, really... I, I would argue that in Episodes 4 and 5, it strikes a really great balance. Now... So the movie, yeah, the movie is dark in tone. Linkar points out it's the prequel with the most consistent tone. And yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Lucas didn't put too many childish, cute things into this. You know, considering episode six had Ewoks, episode one had Jar Jar Binks. I do think you know, this and episode two fare pretty decently. I do think it is a problem for this movie that some of the robots have personalities, which doesn't really make sense for, like, these, you know, programmed soldiers. Why would you put personalities in them? That's some of the only stuff. I realize, in reality, soldiers have personalities, but these movies are, you know, presenting a reality that's completely different from our own. Now, the pacing. The movie is rushed because the first two movies didn't do enough to depict Anakin's fall to the dark side. So this is the only movie before episode four that can do that. Now, the movie is... Yeah, on, on Disney Plus, it's 2 hours and 14 minutes without end credits, 2 hours and 20 minutes with, and the DVD from the the, the DVD that was released, I, I want to say it was in 2005, maybe 2006, is 2 hours, 8 and a half minutes without end credits, 2 hours and 14 and a half minutes with end credits. And... I would say, like, yeah, if, if half an hour in, if you're if you're not interested by then, you know, you're probably not going to like the rest of the movie. But if you do, yeah, it's it's fine to keep watching. It's not going to change your life, but it's fine. So the best element of the movie, at the end of the day, it's still Star Wars. It does actually get some things right with the dark story it goes for. I, if, if you're a huge Star Wars fan, and you know, if you watch the original trilogy, well, yeah, I mean, if you're watching this review, you must have already, you're supposed to have already watched episodes one and two. You know, certainly, then you might as well watch this as well. The worst aspect is that a huge chunk of the action scenes feel pointless. And I do think that is a big deal. Now, I've seen some others say that it's just too dark. I don't think that's too big of a deal. You know, I, I would say you should probably not show this to someone who's not at least 13 years old. Now, I was most worried that this would not be a very satisfying closing out of the trilogy. I would say it it's fine. 
the thing I was most looking forward to was the Star Wars aspect, the creativity, the sound design, the visuals, and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now, it is largely entertaining to watch. The trailers give away too much, but they do also give you a good idea of, of whether or not you like it. If you like the trailers, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. And some of the covers and posters also give too much away, but again, give you a good idea of whether or not you'll like the movie itself. On the tomato meter, this has an 80% based on 302 reviews and a 66% audience score, which, yeah, there's some, there's the movie depict something called Order 66, so it's kind of wild that it also has 66%. Anyway, based on over 250,000 ratings, Of the 302 reviews, 241 of them are fresh. And th the average rating from users is 3.1 out of 5. I would argue it's probably less that this was a good movie and more that just people had resigned themselves to the expectations. And certainly the... The, the, um, ah, what is this? the movie does have some things that work really well. So the meta rating, the, the met, yeah, on Metacritic, this has a 68 out of 100, a 7.8 out of 10 for users. And on IMDb, it has a 7.5 out of 10. And there are 3,694 use IMDb user reviews. And links in, in the IMDb external reviews section, there are 401 links. And yeah, so 26.5% of IMDb users gave it an 8. 21.3% gave it a 7. Yeah, so... And I, I definitely do understand, like, in some ways, this is what you want out of something related to the original trilogy. Now... I think... I, I recommend watching Pop Culture Detectives The Case Against the Jedi Order. Do note it spoils episodes 1 through 6 and an element of episode 7, arguably 8. In general, he makes excellent content. Note that his video, The Tragedy of Droids and Star Wars, spoils all the way through The Mandalorian. But again, excellent video. I recommend this to huge fans of George Lucas' Star Wars and people who just really badly want to get some resolution to the prequel trilogy. And the DVD... Let's see, I wrote down... Yeah, so the, the DVD has a commentary track, it has deleted scenes, documentary featurettes, trailers, TV spots, web documentaries, there's a pretty good amount of, of good stuff. You know, some of... One of the documentaries is an hour and 18 and a half minutes long. And, yeah, it, it gives you a lot of information about the making of the movie. And, you know, if you're considering Disney+, Plus, you know, it has every single Star Wars movie, almost all of the shows, at least in some countries. It even has, like, really old Star Wars stuff. Like, you know, the... the 
I want to say they call it vintage Star Wars, and just yeah, it's they they really ev everything that that they could find they they put on there. And yeah, the the for the movie specifically, there are about thirty nine minutes worth of deleted scenes. And if you already have the DVD, if I recall, there are some there's there's a little bit of overlap, but most of the ones on Disney Plus are not on the DVD. So. I rate this five never-ending, pointless action scenes out of ten. And that brings us to the spoiler sections. Starting with... Thought section start. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of this very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section, once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So, once again, final warning, contain spoilers for, you know, episodes 1 through 6. So, I I do think some aspects of this as a prequel work. I like learning that Anakin turned to the dark side, not because he, you know, not, not out of a, yes, it was because he craved more power, but it wasn't more power so that he could be a tyrant. It was more power so that he could save his wife and children. But in a lot of ways, like, yeah, I'll get more into the, the issues and the thoughts, notes taken before watching section. Now, right. The rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some is MST for the gay riff tracks and other jokes. Time codes for all the sections on the description box. The section right of this one is thoughts on while watching. In chronological order, you can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. And let's see. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? It definitely has empathy for Anakin. I wouldn't really say it has any empathy for Sidious. And I think for both of them, they made the right choice. Like, I don't... I've, you know, I, I know some people don't think that we should see Darth Vader... We shouldn't know that much about Darth Vader before, you know, what we get in the original trilogy. I don't... I certainly don't think we need to see him as a nine-year-old, but... I think we get some interesting stuff in episodes two and three. Now, the... There are some scenes where the there's a very distinct sense of threat to some of the characters, and the movie doesn't overexpose the sources of threat. The source of danger. Now, that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. The opening long take is really, really cool. Not made less cool or impressive by it being animated instead of live action. It still takes a lot of effort and talent. But I do wish it wasn't so busy and visually overwhelming. Now, for sure, I'll, I'll rant. Our eye is pulled towards Obi-Wan and Anakin's two fighters, but there's still way too much going on on screen for a lot of it. 
for the opening space battle in general, not only the long take. And I think it should have revealed that it's Anakin and Obi-Wan right from the start, although thankfully they do reveal it fairly early. When the two Jedi back into the elevator with destroyers in front of them, battle droids in the back, stuck in the middle with you, the moment that the battle droids say hands up, you realize if those battle droids had started shooting the moment the elevator doors opened, the two Jedi would have had no way to defend themselves. They didn't even know about the battle droids until they gave away their own position. And before you say, oh, but, you know, they wanted to take them alive, then why were the destroyer droids firing shields up? If even one of those blasts actually hits one of the Jedi, it could seriously injure them, even kill them. Okay, it is a tiny bit funny when R2 has to hide the communicator because there are droids nearby that can hear Obi-Wan. It's, you know, at first it has it out in, like, the, the, you know, the little thing that can hold on to things, and then it, like, pulls, you know, it, it opens a, a compartment and sticks it in there and closes it, but you can still hear it, and it's, it's just muffled instead of echoing. It was a little funny. You, you know, that's that's the kind of joke that, you know, you don't feel embarrassed to laugh at even when you're an adult. Get help. What? Let's do get help. What's the point of even having super battle droids? You know, the ones that fire from the hand instead of having, like, gun to attack you know, attacking Obi-Wan if he's going to that easily take them out. Remember how badass they were in Attack of the Clones? How dangerous they seemed? I feel like I heard someone say that the artificial gravity no longer working temporarily on the ship wouldn't work like that in real life, but it is a decent enough element. Honestly, the bit where the two Jedi and the Sith Lord are falling down an elevator shaft that they were, you know, walking in on the, on the side... They were walking on the wall. And then artificial gravity comes back and they're sliding down. You know, it's one of the scenes in the movie where there's the strongest sense of danger. You know, there's... I mean, even even though we know for a fact that all three of them survive. See? No problem. And then the droids enter and Obi-Wan goes... Problem. If the, if the Chancellor hadn't been kidnapped, they might have never brought us back from the Outer Rim sieges. See, that's good writing. One line of dialogue, and we completely understand why what we saw happen happened. Palpatine orchestrated his own kidnapping specifically to make sure that Anakin was brought back from said sieges so that he could conclude his manipulation and make him a Sith Lord. I understand that using an establishing shot is a tried and true method, but I do think that when General Grievous arrives at the base that he goes to, we shouldn't see the actual place that he lands. We should only see that he has landed somewhere, so that the next time we see this place, we don't yet know if it is where Grievous is. You know, it should be that... I heard someone call him a... Was it a cosplayer of... Ah, crap, I forget. It's... But, but yeah, you know, the, the guy with the, the gray skin and the teeth and the... I, I don't mind that someone who looks like that isn't a bad guy. I just hope they realized when they put him in the marketing, of course we were going to think that that was a bad guy. Look at what he looks like. And we see Anakin and Padme on the balcony together. Considering when George Lucas was born, the decades he grew up in, it's honestly quite surprising that only the sixth time he made a Star Wars movie, he had a prominent female character focus on nothing else but her baby and the man she's romantically involved with. It just sucks that it's Padme Amidala, who was such a badass... You know, she, she's so competent in Episodes 1 and 2. She's such a badass in her action scenes in Episode 2. When Anakin and Padme are on the balcony together, I want to say it was Jill Barrop? Jill Barrop, who points out that Padme shouldn't be brushing her hair when she has curls. I'll have to take her word for it. I don't know anything about that kind of thing. 
but I think it does demonstrate that, you know, the hair and makeup department either didn't know or didn't think about that the scene called for her brushing her hair. And Padme and Anakin talk about the nightmare she had. And again, Padme says she can't be with the senator if she's got a husband, something like that. Again, without explaining why. All of this is unusual, and it's making me feel uneasy. How unlike you. Frankly, unbelievable and very untoward. Anakin starts protesting being on the council, but not being a Jedi Master. We get reaction shots of Obi-Wan and Mace Windu, who both look like they can barely believe the script. A prophecy that Miss Red could have been. Ha, <laughs> you've got this all wrong. It's not supposed to say, we'll bring balance to the Force, no killing Jedi. No, no, it's, we'll bring balance to the Force, no, killing Jedi. Anakin, come closer. I have good news. Closer. Closer, please. A little too close. Step back. Split the difference. If they haven't involved you in their plot yet, I'm sure they soon they, they will. I'm not sure I understand. See, this is what we've been telling you, George. Even your own characters do not understand the plot. I don't know what to say. Having nothing good to say has never stopped you before, Anakin. Is it possible to learn this power? And the number one winner of the dramatic Sinister Head Turn Awards is... We briefly see the Kashyyyk Wookiee action scene. I don't mind the Tarzan move, but the Tarzan yell, I feel, might have been excessive. Goodbye, old friend. May the Force be with you. I genuinely hope that the next time the two of us share a scene, it will not be a tragic conclusion to our story in these three movies. It is legitimately super cool when General Greaves reveals that his arms split apart. So you can have four arms, four lightsabers at the same time. And apparently, like, they specifically designed they they specifically designed him so that when his arms are just normal, he has six fingers. So when they split apart, both arms still have three There it is. I got there eventually. Three fingers, which is just enough to clutch a lightsaber. It enough that you can you know fight with it or use it as a helicopter. I, I quite like, I, I want to say it was the the pitch meeting where he says he's been trained in the Jedi arts by Count Dooku. Oh. And he's been trained in the helicopter arts by a helicopter. Because it, it, it looks like a helicopter. Yeah. Also very cool when after Obi-Wan force pushes General Grievous he's crawling on all of his arms and legs like a spider or something. I kind of wish it would go on for longer, but I mean, I get someone almost definitely brought their child to that, like a nine-year-old or eight-year-old or something. And, you know, you want to limit how many nightmares you give this poor kid. Anakin, deliver this news to the Chancellor. His reaction will give us a clue as to his intentions. Mace, you don't have to make up excuses. We all want to see more of his facial expressions. More and more, I get the sense that I'm being excluded from the council. I know it's called the No Anakins Club, but they let in Anakin Glumplet, and then they said, no, it's No Anakins, plural. They're allowed to have one. I know what's been troubling you. Listen to me. Dude, you don't have to ask. We all love your delivery of these lines. I like when Gen when Obi-Wan and General Grievous are, I guess the word is jousting, when they're side by side. Okay, the word is definitely not jousting. Anyway, when they're side by side in, you know, Grievous is in a vehicle, Obi-Wan is on the iguana, and they're like fighting over the stick with the purple lightning. I mean, okay, geez, George, we get it. You really, really like the cherry chase in Ben Hur, but man, is it fun to watch? Obi Wan, in the heat of battle, kicks General Reeves, and then it claims in pain. Ah, what? 
Oh, right, metal. A Sith Lord? Yes, the one we've been looking for. I mean, it certainly would have been annoying if this still wasn't the one you've been looking for. And, yeah, I mentioned in the review, but it... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and spell out that, you know, the bit with Anakin and Padme looking towards each other in different buildings, completely silent, some of the best acting in the prequel trilogy. Mace Windu goes to arrest Sidious, says he is in the Senate yet. You speak treason fluently. I can't hold on any longer. Well, you don't need to. Your face looks sufficiently like it did in the original trilogy now. I will do whatever you ask. Sorry, I just got off the treadmill. Palpatine names Anakin Darth Vader and cut to Yoda, who's like, Call my agent, I must. If they are not all destroyed, it will be civil war without end. That is some high-quality, military-grade manipulation right there. With that kind of thinking, you can rationalize the monstrous killings that Anakin is about to carry out. I think you'll be needing this... You sure you want to do that, Commander Cody? In about 30 seconds, you're going to wish you went Finder's Keepers instead. Order 66 is being executed. We briefly see Yoda drop his canes, clearly in distress. When you have a headache this big... Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? And Anakin goes to kill him for outacting him. There are too many of... Okay, so these kids would have run out, lightsabers in hand, trying to take out these troops if there weren't so many of them. These kids are actually prepared for that. Jedi training is intense. I'm sorry, sir. It is time for you to leave. And your house guests have officially overstayed their welcome. I saw Master Windu attempt to assassinate the Chancellor myself. Oh, Anakin, what are we going? What are you going to do? First things first, a dramatic turn away from the camera. Then, I'm going to take your staff. And then, I'm going to Disney World. When my new apprentice arrive, Darth Vader arrives, he will take care of you. I mean, that is 100% accurate to what does happen. They just misinterpreted what he meant by take care of you. Take her out? Anyway. Why is he holding his hands like this? Is he part T-Rex? Oh, no, wait, I get it. He's, he's standing on his hind legs. He's like, oh, he's begging. Who's a good boy? And the intercutting of Chancellor Palpatine talking about the Jedi plot with Anakin killing the Separatist leaders, Obi-Wan and Yoda realizing someone with a lightsaber killed the youngs is legitimately effective and chilling. Obi-Wan is certain he won't be able to kill Anakin. He is like my brother. You know he's the one who ate the cookies from the cookie jar and then told mom it was you, right? Okay, he's dead. Padme lands on Mustafa. We see that she's clearly sad. Come on, just focus on how close you are to being out of this movie. Obi-Wan told me things. Oh, no, not things. Love won't save you, Padme. The Beatles think it will. I don't want to hear any more about Obi-Wan. Well, Disney Plus hopes you're alone in feeling that way. Holy crap, Obi-Wan. I'm not sure you could possibly have picked a worse time to emerge from the ship. Don't make me kill you. Right now, all I want to make you do is face me. I've been waiting for this for a long time, my little green friend. Listen to that guy laugh. He's definitely having a good time. I have more to say about the scene where Sidious and Yoda fight in the middle of the Senate in the next section. Here, I definitely want to make sure to say I like the detail that it is basically the Chancellor's chair from his office that rises 
to get him into the middle of the Senate. That makes a lot of sense logistically. Darth Sidious is attacking Yoda with Senate interior decorating. Master Yoda, would you like to take would you like a seat at the Senate? How would you like to chair a committee? Let's table this discussion for a later time. I'm pretty sure they made that blue guy who's always standing next to the Chancellor in this prequel trilogy look more sinister and dark now that Sidious is full on Empire mode. Nice touch. In true exile, I must go. Close the gap between the prequel trilogy and original trilogy. It will. I have failed you, Anakin. You did not score well enough on your written exam for a passing grade. You were the chosen one! It was said that- holy crap, you look like you're in extreme pain. Are you okay, dude? Excuse me, Master Yoda? Have a good excuse for interrupting my looking pensive and sad. You better. My wife and I have long considered adopting a baby girl. She will be loved. What of the boy? Well, you see, we kind of only have room for one baby in our home, and we already called dibs on the girl. And that brings us to the final section, entitled, Notes Taken Before Watching. According to Lucas from on the commentary track, when Anakin rises in the, the armor suit, it's like Frankenstein's monster, and he takes his first, first breath while Padme takes her last. So her death and his birth as Darth Vader are connected like that. And... McDermott, Lucas, and others have called Anakin's journey to the dark side Faustian in the sense of making a pact with the devil for short-term gain, the fiery volcano planet Mustafar representing hell. I think that's a good idea, but the movie makes it look like it, you know, it's entirely too abrupt of a choice that, that he makes. I think it would work better if he at first tried to avoid doing anything evil. Honestly, maybe the movie should have started with him making this deal and then the rest of the movie should have been him slowly doing more evil, rationalizing it all the way. Because as it is, he kind of goes from zero to genocide in minutes. Now, according to Wikipedia, some American conservatives criticized the film, claiming it had a liberal bias, was a commentary on the George W. Bush administration and Iraq war. And some websites went so far as to propose a boycott of the film, which... <laughs> Lucas defended the film, stating that the film's storyline was written during the Vietnam War, was influenced by that conflict rather than the war in Iraq. So. You know, clearly, it's not actually... Oh, wait, what does that say? Lucas also said that the parallels between Vietnam and what we're doing in Iraq now are unbelievable. Wow, dude. Why, why do you even bother starting with a defense if you're then just gonna... Wow. So yeah, the the um, yeah in two thousand seven, Doctor Eric Bouy, a psychiatrist in Toulouse, France, wrote co-wrote a study that diagnosed Anakin Skywalker as having borderline personality disorder or BPD, 
and the authors reported their findings at the end of the meeting. Yeah, they said that Skywalker fit the diagnosis criteria, difficulty controlling anger, stress-related breaks with reality, impulsivity, obsession with abandonment, and a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating between extremes of ideation and devaluation. That makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure if that was something that Lucas specifically was, like, if he was thinking, I gotta make him BPD, or if it just, the ideas he had for how Anakin would behave fit that without him really thinking, but yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense, and I really appreciate that it is this quite consistent thing when, you know, it, it would have been really frustrating if it was just all over the place. Now, I saw th there's a YouTube video where a sword expert points out there's too much spinning and twirling, too much standing in one spot while fencing instead of trying to gain ground on the other fighter. So the yeah in in this movie the the juggernaut also known as the turbo tank is based on designs for the ATAT that Joe Johnson made for episode five which just makes you wonder why they're slower in the original trilogy think of how effective the Empire would be on Hoth if the ATATs were much faster now the Apparently, this movie was released just six days after the airing of the final episode of Star Trek Enterprise. So you could wash the bad taste out of your mouth. Sure. And According to MDB Trivia, Count Dooku was originally supposed to beg Anakin to spare his life. However, Sir Christopher Lee talked George Lucas out of this, arguing it was out of character. I'm really glad that I'm I'm completely agree with him. That would not make sense for his character. As we've seen him up to that point. Ian McDermott claimed that George Lucas pushed for so many takes of the scene Palpatine kills Mace Windu that his maniacal, exhausted collapse on his back of hysterical laughter at the end was not acting. Lucas was pleased with the take. Wow. Now, Linkara points out that the movie should have had Count Dooku turn into General Grievous, since Count Dooku is in the movie too little, General Grievous doesn't have backstory that is given in the movie, and that the movie should show fa the fascism that the Chancellor is, uh, yeah, the, the rise of fascism better. Maybe there could be clone troopers on every street corner show don't tell and the film barely tells the most in deleted scenes in one of the interviews on the dvd and the special features hayden christensen said he was mostly focused on the scenes of anakin skywalker turning to the dark side but he came to understand that parts of the movie were before that i feel like that maybe explain that that explains why so much of his performance is dark and off-putting i i'm not sure if he was doing this already in Attack of the Clones, but certainly that would explain why he's so creepy when he's trying to romance Padme. He thinks that the character is already, you know, he's he's ready for the character to be dark side already. Now, the action scenes showing the war, you know, we, we can't tell who's winning, and after a while, you know, you, you basically realize that the only real reason for these scenes to exist is that George Lucas wanted, you know, for one thing, he wanted to show a lot of planets. And for another, 
he wanted to show the clones killing Jedi's in in you know yeah in different places to to get across that it wasn't it isn't just happening in this one place it's not only happening on Coruscant for example but you can do that without showing other parts of those battles of the war and yeah a, a lot of the best commentary on how fascism is spread and takes over is in this movie we you know now that the chancellor no longer needs the people he's manipulated he has them executed but it would work better if the movie had a more convincing transition from Anakin Skywalker knowing he's working with Jedi Knights to him accepting working for Chancellor Palpatine a Sith you know once he knows he's a Sith Lord it simply isn't credible the way it is in the movie now I'm not one of those men who think that women the fact that women become pregnant and have babies makes them weak but I do think that this movie makes Padme I'm, I'm not sure weak is the, the right word but the the fact that she doesn't get anything else to do when she was very active both in combat and in the Senate in the first two movies you know this movie basically thinks of her as nothing but a pregnant woman a victim you know she basically her role in this movie is to give birth to Luke and Leia and then die so that she can m motivate men you know men men's pain it's such a passive act it might as well be an object and it really sucks to see for a character who's been so interesting in the first two movies in this movie Anakin Skywalker should be easy to identify with and feel a lot of empathy for he has you know he has what he always thought he wanted becoming a Jedi his mentor Palpatine is proud of him and he's considered you know the the yeah re representative in in the Jedi Council he's marrying the girl he fell in love with despite and despite this he feels like there's something wrong it hasn't actually made him happy even though he thought that it would make him happy he's very concerned about the people he loves he's determined to do the right thing but at the end of the day it is difficult to identify with him and it's not because he probably is BPD or maybe on the spectrum like autistic uh, you know I've, I've seen several suggest that and I would say there's definitely some evidence that points to that it's difficult to have sim to, to really yeah have sympathy for him and the reason for that is that in episode 2 he's constantly whiny and he kills an entire village for revenge you know after that it's just really difficult to to get yeah for for us to empathize with him again i i quite like that palpatine uses you know literal senate seats as weapons against yoda he thinks of democracy as a weapon not a tool to help the majority now you know Anakin says from my point of view the Jedi are evil it's a good point but it's a very clumsy line and the if you are not with me then you are my enemy just have him l say if you're not with me you are against me you know that's that's clearly what he wants him to say now the duel between Anakin and Obi-Wan is too long and it's just it's really difficult to take seriously if you know just a tiny bit about lava it would be way too hot to be that close to it I I wish they had just chosen something else that would be you know some something else that's dangerous to touch but something that doesn't 
release such intense heat. Like, it's clear, yes, this is the Star Wars galaxy, but lava is still extremely hot. But they're acting like it's only hot if you touch it. You know, they, they would never be able to be as close to it as they are in the scene. I just, I try not to let things that like that ruin a scene for me, but here it's just, it's impossible. And, like, when he does eventually catch fire, does he... I think he's barely touching the lava, maybe, but his entire body catches fire in very little time. It's it's like, okay, now the lava has the properties the lava had in real life. And I I think it was a huge mistake that we actually hear Luke and Leia's names. Like, if you watch episodes one through three before four through six, you've the these movies have spoiled basically all of the biggest twits, twist and twits the biggest twits in episodes 4 through 6 no more when grievous is that fast with lightsabers and he's like a cyborg part robot why is anakin so much slower in episodes 4 through 6 why are robots and spacecraft so much slower i've heard some say oh dictatorships slow down innovation and the people who made those things died in this movie that's rationalizing. There would be at least some... St like, okay, so every single schematic has been destroyed as well. What about all the vehicles that by the end of this movie are still intact? You're telling me that there's not a single, like, smart person working for the evil galactic empire who can, like, take some of these things apart? What's it called? Uh reverse engineer or something, you know. I don't know why this movie has R2-D2 suddenly be, like, legitimately sadistic to droids, which evidently feel pain, and why is it played for laughs? It's in really bad taste. Like, if you're watching this video and you haven't watched the movie in a while, the specific parts I'm referring to are when... Excuse me. When when the super battle droids pick up R two D two in the in the ship at the start, and he like sprays out a bunch of oil, and then he uses his the the fact that he can fly, he uses that on the to to ignite the oil, and they're burning, and we're supposed to laugh. Well, it it seems like they're feeling pain, and he also. The, the part where they're in the ship with Grievous and he just like he's zapping some robots and he's like he's doing all kinds of things and yeah it seems like they're feeling pain and it comes off as him not just you know not considering a necessary evil but kind of getting some enjoyment out of it it's yeah And, yeah, I already mentioned in the review that, you know, this movie is way too obsessed with the idea that everything in episodes 4 through 6 needs to be explained by something in episodes 1 through 3. Which affects all three films negatively, but it's at its worst in this. Palpatine has to look the way, you know, and by the end of this movie, Palpatine needs to look the way he does in episode 5 and 6, even though there's, like... Like, there's 19 years between episodes 3 and 4, and I want to say 2 years between episodes 4 and 5, so that seems like plenty of time, you know, it, it could just happen naturally. Like, maybe start down that road, but you don't have to speed down that road. Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala's children are adopted and, you know, for some reason they hide Luke Skywalker on the same planet his father grows up. They keep his last name even though he's, like, literally just raise him away from family, change his name, you know, all these things. Anyway. And Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi are, you know, enter exile, despite Yoda doing a great job fighting the Chancellor. Like, hypothetically, again, I'm not the first person to say, but just 
like if Yoda and Obi-Wan attacked the Chancellor at the same time, there's a good chance they could take him. Yoda does a really great job in that fight. And I, I get it, you know, they wanted a dramatic, climactic battle. It just, it, it raises so many questions. You know, th this would work so much better if the, you know, if Yoda was already old and exhausted in this movie the way he is in episodes 5 and 6. And, you know, it in most of episode 1 and 2, it seemed like he was this old, exhausted person. And if the clones, you know, yeah, if the clones are, are made to kill Jedi on sight, why is Obi-Wan Kenobi still going around in, in episode 4 wearing what Jedi evidently normally wear when he's on Tatooine? Does he not have a single other outfit to, you know, something that could help hide him being a Jedi? C-3PO needs to have his memory wiped because he knows important secrets about things that happen in this trilogy. You know, okay, so I'm not going to argue that that's... I'll grant that that's logical. But it's kind of gross that he's, you know, he's not being treated like a person, but like a slave by a Jedi. And, you know, you end up wondering, maybe the Jedi don't have that big of a problem with slavery. They didn't do very much to free slaves all the years between episodes one and three. And, you know, the... the I'm not going to talk about whether these movies focus on disability being a sign of evil is ableist or not. People who know far more about it have written excellent articles about it online. If Count Dooku wasn't going to be in more of Star Wars in, in this movie than he ended up being, why not just keep Darth Maul alive? Grievous is interesting, but he's not, you know, he's not actually that intense in very much of the movie, only when he attacks Obi-Wan with the four lightsabers at once, and the fact that he coughs makes him less scary and just makes him a little more confusing. Like, if so much of him is a robot, why does he have a cough? I mean, I guess the, the cough is supposed to be, okay, so, you know, they had a bunch of, you know, there, there were still some grievous coughs because there's still some bugs to work out, by the time they're making Darth Vader into a cyborg, there's no cough, but the, you know, the breathing, I, I get that. And that is actually legitimately kind of clever because it's the kind of thing you wouldn't think about. But yeah, if you're like changing someone from, if, if, if a person becomes like a cyborg, there's going to be things that, things that they took for granted that are now more difficult and yeah breathing would be one of those things but it just like i mean on that yeah in that case wait didn't grievous only fairly recently become a cyborg or or can't they just like go back and and change it to fix it it just it doesn't make a lot of sense so on the one hand i I'm inclined to criticize the, you know, the love between Anakin and Padme being partially based on, you know, like he, he worships her. He's been in love with her since he was nine and she was 14. And part of their love is that he saves her life. He protects her. You know, he, he expresses obsession with her. This is not a healthy way for a romantic relationship to be. It would be a lot healthier if he worked on those emotions so that they could have a more equal relationship. But on the other hand, like, their relationship has some really bad, like, 
at the end of the day, the, the relationship does culminate in him choking her and turning to the dark side. So, honestly, it might actually be intentionally warning those kinds of aspects of some people's relationship. I'm not saying all relationships that have those aspects will end up that badly, but, like, they are they are red flags. You, sh you shouldn't be with... It's, it's not a healthy relationship to be, like, yeah, I pretty much made my point, so, moving on. I agree that it's effective that the chance, you know, yeah, the Palpatine manipulates his enemies with lies and confusion, but I would say it also ends up meaning that a lot of the children and teenagers who he said he makes the movies for don't understand why the bad guys actually win in episodes one through three. You know, if, if you only watch episodes four through six, you can tell that the, you know, among other things, the all the bad guys are the same while the good guys are a varied group of people with different ideas, you know, they come together and win. And there are, yeah, and, and a number of very fascist traits, you know, yeah, the, the bad guys in 4 through 6 do things that fascists do in, in real life as well. And it just, it, it doesn't work as well in in these three movies for, for that aspect. It's, it's kind of more that's there for the adults to appreciate. The Emperor is a genius. He's impossible to... to uh, what's he called? Im impossible to, to stop. And not good at hiding what he does in episodes 1 through 3. No matter what the heroes do, his plans always work out because of backup plans. Now, in episodes 5 and 6, he almost wins because of how strong the Empire is and because Han Solo can't get that hyperspeed engine to hyperspeed drive. Man, has it really been that long? The, yeah, the, the thing to work. But he ends up losing because he's so sure that hate is stronger than love. And he definitely loses in episode 4, which makes him winning in episodes 5 and 6 hit much harder. You know, I get that at the end of the day, of course, he's going to, by the end of episode 3, for sure he's going to have won. Otherwise, he wouldn't be as powerful in episodes 4 through 6 as he is. But his plans are so much more, so you know, much better and much more complicated in episodes 1 through 3. Honestly, it feels like it's just different person. And I think an argument could be made that maybe it should be. Like, maybe for most of the prequels, it should be, like, let's say Darth Plagueis. And then at the very, very tail end of Episode 3, we see, you know, someone... Yeah, maybe he's been talking about uh, an apprentice that we haven't... We've only been... We've heard reference to him, but we haven't seen him before. And then the, the apprentice kills him from off screen, and then the camera turns, and we see that it's Sidious. You know, but, yeah. I don't think that the movie really gets anything, like, really compelling out of showing Jedi Knights being killed by clone troopers. It feels more like Lucas felt that he had to explain what happened to the Jedi that we see in these three movies that aren't in it's episodes 4 through 6. And yeah, we do see them die, so we understand that, but we don't feel anything because we don't know a single one of them that, you know, any... Like the 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 only Jedi who dies in this movie that we knows that we know all uh, at all 
is Mace Windu, and we don't know that much about him. And I think it would have been a good idea if Qui-Gon Jinn died in this movie. Or, you know, if the... If we did actually learn a lot about the Jedi who are in episodes 1 through 3, but Lucas chose to focus on the ones that we already know survive until at least episode 4. And it is a good idea that we learn more about Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Yoda. But it does mean that the... Yeah, the ones we see die in this... There's no emotional reaction, at, at least not based on us knowing the, the, these individuals. You know, it, there, there's an emotional reaction based on the concept of them dying. And if Qui-Gon Jinn had survived until, but not including, Order 66, we'd feel way more. Imagine, imagine if throughout Episode 3, gradually we come to realize, oh no, by the end of this movie, Qui-Gon Jinn must die. And then we see Order 66, you know. Now, let's see. Yeah, and one of the problems with the, you know, by, by the end of the movie, the audience realizes basically the vast majority of the action scenes in this movie are meaningless. Not only because we already know who lives and dies, but because all of the battle scenes, like, who cares who wins? Chance, the, the Chancellor wins no matter which side wins. You know, if... If you want to make a movie where there are so many conflicts that just help the bad guy, no matter who wins and who loses. Either don't show so many of these conflicts, or just... Yeah, you know, there, there are other ways. There are other movies that handle this kind of thing, you know... I think I may have already mentioned The Dark Knight in one of these. And, yes, you know, this, this video is for people aged 13 and up, so, you know, if you, yeah, you shouldn't be watching this video if you are. So, the Joker in The Dark Knight, you know, sometimes things will work out for him, even though it seemed like either how could they, or, well, no, they must, they must specifically end up badly for him, but it doesn't, ah, yeah, I guess I can't really without spoiling. Yeah, okay, so some spoilers for The Dark Knight. Part of why it works well there is The Dark Knight is not showing us how fascism comes to be. It's telling us, you know, it's it's that thing of what happens if an immovable object hits an un unstoppable force hits an immovable object. It's testing how how far will Batman go to stop the Joker? And, yeah. No more spoilers for The Dark Knight. In this movie, it is about, well, how did the Chancellor get so much power? How did he become the, the Emperor of the Galactic Empire? Why are they so powerful throughout the Star Wars galaxy? And so, yeah, it just ends up like... Hypothetically, if you just read this in a history book, that would maybe be fine. Like if, but but the but but to see it, to spend so much time watching all these battles that just don't matter. Like, yeah, I think Freud would have a thing or two to say about Anakin Skywalker having the same dreams about his wife that he had about his mother. But it is a pretty decent idea because we do know his mother ended up dying after he had these nightmares. We don't really have any reason to believe that his wife will survive this movie. And, you know, at this point, we'll, you know, maybe someone will say, well, we were told in the other movies that Leia remembered her mother. Yeah, but these movies are not that good at overall continuity. 
I realize there are other ways to make action scenes dramatic, but I do think that this movie has too many duels that end with the people dueling surviving. And too many of them are very late into the movie, and the scenes just, they're so long, we're just sitting there waiting for them to conclude. Now, there are some years... Yeah, I believe there's 19 years between the ending of episode 3 and the start of episode 4. So, I understand that, you know, maybe they ended up getting too old to move as fast and be as good fighters. But it just feels wrong the last time we see Obi-Wan and Yoda in this movie. They're so much faster than the next, you know, when we see them in episodes 4 and 5, respectively. I don't take issue with Anakin moving so much slower in the original trilogy, considering his injuries at the end of this. And I, yeah, I do also think that the Emperor, it doesn't make that much sense that he's so... so much slower in the original trilogy. Now, the final fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin is ridiculously big. Honestly, it more reminds me of like the climax of a John Woo movie, like Face Off. Like They keep going between locations and different dangerous situations. I love John Woo, but I don't think John Woo and Star Wars really go together. Like Comparatively, a Star Wars duel that I feel works much better as a tragic Star Wars duel is the, the one in Empire Strikes Back. I think it would be compelling if, for the first shot, for the first chunk of it, Obi-Wan basically refuses to fight Anakin, so Anakin kind of wipes the floor with him the way that he wipes the floor with Luke in Empire, but then near the end of it, Obi-Wan makes the difficult choice and fights back, fights back hard. And at first they're equally matched, but after a little bit, you see that Obi-Wan is the better fighter, since in A New Hope, Darth Vader specifically says, when I left you, I was but the learner, but now I am the master. Considering how evenly matched they are in this movie, that line doesn't make that much sense. Now, it's not really said in the movie, but I think it's in the commentary track or something. George Lucas has explained about Padme's death. Obviously, part of it is that Anakin chokes Padme, and then she loses the will to live because of how evil he's become. But she draws her last breath when Darth Vader draws his first, so Palpatine did teach Anakin how to stop people from dying. But not Padme, only himself, because let's be honest, he probably should have died from his injuries on Mustafar. Her death means he can survive something that he really shouldn't have. Because of his drive to conquer death, which, you know, if you compare to episode 6, he openly accepts his death, because he has now learnt to conquer not death, but his fear of death. He doesn't try to find some way that he will survive after the Emperor is dead. He accepts it and focuses on Luke surviving instead. Way too much in the prequels isn't explained well enough. We understand the core conflicts in the original trilogy, even though there's a lot we don't know about the Star Wars galaxy, but these movies, so much of the time, you don't really know enough about the mythology to follow what's going on You know, for for a lot of you, just kind of zone out until there's another action scene, especially if you first watched them when you were a child or a teenager. The reason I didn't really go into this until now is that, you know, the end of this movie, these things have still not really been explained. I was giving the trilogy a chance to, you know, what's it called, backfill, you know, fill, fill things in here at the end. I remember that it didn't, but it would be spoiled for this movie if I said it in one of the other videos that it did not. I don't think we should see anything in... Let's see... Yeah, the the Darth, Darth Vader suit at the end is... I think the last thing we should see was that, like, Anakin goes into some sort of machine that Sidious says it's going to save his life so that canonically, if you watch these in the episode order, the first time you see Darth Vader is at the very start of A New Hope, and you have no reason to think that that's Anakin Skywalker. 
Actually, yeah, the, the maybe the last time we see him, he should almost be like in a coma or something. And Sidious... Yeah, and Sidious should say something that sounds like he's talking about, don't worry, I have another apprentice. But really, he is referring... He's saying that I have a way to bring Anakin Skywalker back to life. You know, I, th I think that would work. As a, yeah. Only a Sith deals in, deals in absolutes. That is, in fact, an absolute. That is absolutely an absolute. So apparently Palpatine planned on the capture, but the ship he's on almost crashes. He couldn't possibly be sure that it wouldn't lead to their deaths. Like, when you see the, the giant space battle, clearly some of the, the clone troopers are shooting at that ship. Like, it makes no sense that... Yeah. It wouldn't be a Star Wars prequel if George Lucas didn't kill off a compelling character way too early. So, in this, he kills off Count Dooku after almost no screen time, and he also kills off John Grievous too fast. When Darth Sidious turns the Republic into the Galactic Empire, he says that the Jedi will be hunted down and defeated for betraying the Republic. So basically similar to how Hitler used the Jews as a scapegoat and called for all of them to be killed. I understand that George Lucas really badly wanted for this movie to end with Darth, Sid Darth Sidious having the appearance that he has in the original trilogy, but I read a theory that the reason the Emperor's body and features are gnarled is because of his extended use of the dark side of the Force and some people speculate the first lightning deflection and feedback eroded away some kind of mystical facade. I think he should look exactly the same until right after Anakin disarms Mace Windu, who then goes flying out the window. At this point, when Palpatine rises again and Anakin pledges loyalty to him, Sidious should move his hand across his face, and as he does this, he, become, he comes to look the way he did in the original trilogy, and maybe he even says something like, then I no longer have any need to hide my true nature from you, or something. The events of this movie really do not feel like it takes place over enough time for Padme to go from, you know, only recently becoming pregnant at the start of the movie to giving birth to two healthy babies at the very end. I guess it doesn't have to be a full nine months, but it has to be more than six. The idea to hide Luke Skywalker on the same planet that his father grew up on really doesn't make any sense. They also didn't change his last name. And again, I really think this comes down to George Lucas was too married to the idea of things in these two trilogies being echoes of each other, like poetry. They rhyme. So of course, both Skywalkers grow up on the same planet. Think of how easy it would be to just have Anakin grow up on a different planet and, let's see, name-wise, let's see, I mean... Darth Vader says, I want to say episode 6, that the name Anakin Skywalker no longer has any meaning to him. <sighs> yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not sure the, the name can really be fixed, but... In, in the prequels, really, I mean. As far as I've been able to tell, nothing in Attack of the Clones was changed after 9-11, but definitely a few things in this movie that are inspired by the movie being made after 9-11 happened. I've seen others point to the shot of the Jedi Temple on fire. Samuel Jackson isn't in the prequels because it makes sense that it's him playing that role. It's a waste of his talent. Most of the other major characters in these movies get to show their talent at at least one point in time but you know his thing is like he's he's a badass and he he commands attention and he he shouts and like he shouts a little bit right before he dies but it's not it's it's too little for for how he yeah The movie doesn't really explain what it is that the Sith want revenge for. I think it would have made the movie more interesting if we did know. Now, let's see. Scenes with lightsabers where multiple people having have lightsabers use them against each other. 
yeah, in in all three of the prequels, continue until you know basically the filmmakers don't want them to continue, and then they end in a way that could have had you know they they the thing that causes them to end is something that could have could easily have happened much earlier in the scene. Now, yeah, by by the end of this movie, it is completely clear Jedi don't make a priority out of freeing slaves. Even the ones who are related to Jedi, you know, maybe this is be maybe it is that Lucas thought this was the only way to make sure that Anakin's mother would die without him being able to do anything to stop it. I think she should have been freed between episodes one and two and then died from some kind of incurable disease instead. It's kind of like this, you know, as, as it is, it wasn't really inevitable. You could have stopped this by freeing slaves. Seems like the kind of thing for powerful Jedi to want to do. You know, I, I, they don't do it that much in the original trilogy because there are so few of them. They're fighting to stop the evil Galactic Empire. But what's their excuse in the prequels? You know, the war doesn't start until the end of the second movie. What's their excuse for all of episode... Yeah. Episode 1 and episode 2 prior to that. Now, there are too few lines in the scenes where Anakin is tempted into doing evil things, like killing Count Dooku, attacking Mace Windu. We don't believe that he would make the decision we see him make. It's a disconnect between the film and the audience there. Originally, there were more lines. Palpatine would say things to drive Anakin to do what he wanted him to do, but most of them were cut, and it really hurts these scenes. Like, apparently, originally, he was going to say, which apparently was supposed to be true, that Count Dooku paid the Sand People to kill yeah, to, to kidnap and torture his mother, you know, okay, now I understand why he killed uh, Count Dooku, even though, you know, you could st still right after he say, oh, I shouldn't have done that, but the way it is right now, it just, he says, kill him, and then he does, and it's just, well, where did that come from? There's no good reason for Yoda and Obi-Wan not to both attack the Chancellor together. It feels like Lucas had the idea for these final duels and for them to be one-on-ones before he decided that he would have Jedi team up when fighting especially dangerous opponent opponents but they do that in all three of these movies I know Lucas is going for an honorable time where knights with honor fought with honor for honor but that's not a given after Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan gang up on Maul yes Maul has a dual-bladed lightsaber, but they were gonna take that guy on before they knew that. Like, and and again, like, e there's an easy fix. Just like have, you know, when when Darth Maul, you know, f first like takes the hood off, Qui Gon could tell Obi Wan, "I'll deal with him myself," and then you know the second blade extends on the saber, and Obi Wan is, I think you might need uh, backup or something like that. The tragic endings of this movie don't hit as hard as the tragic endings of Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight or even Jedi Academy, and we spent a lot less time watching those characters, although we do play as them. And no, I will not be spoiling the details of those tragic endings, and it's not a secret that there is a downer ending for both of those games. I think it's fine that the high ground trick works th thing works out for Obi-Wan. He learned that trick from seeing how vulnerable Darth Maul was in that situation, driving him to la learn a way out himself, the way traumatized people memorize where the exits are. And honestly, he might have even taught Anakin that that worked against Maul, leading him to think that it was a sure thing. Now, I am not going to be talking about the movies that... Let's say he came yeah the the movies that were released later than this movie where what does that say right yeah the 
the sequel trilogy. In this movie, the Chancellor and later Anakin, you know, basically say that Jedi and Sith are just two different points of view. One isn't good, one is, you know, it's not that one is good and the other is evil. I don't necessarily mind a philosophical debate like that, but I don't think that this movie does a good job arguing that the Chancellor is right about that, and it seems like the idea is supposed to be that it's making an argument for that. And I don't... What does that say? Yeah, I, I think it's too bad to even bring it up. That... Yeah, bring, bring something up that, like with a lot of other things for the prequels, end up being too vague. I don't mind Star Wars becoming more complicated than they were complex than they were in episodes four through six where they're very black and white about the the light side and the dark side of the force I yeah I I think it would be great if this movie did do a really great job exploring that Ian McDermott does give some really goofy line deliveries and pull some really goofy faces during his performance especially once he goes full Emperor it doesn't bother me that much. He's having fun. I'm having fun. We're all having fun. His performance is too much fun for me to be that upset about. Now, Yoda and Mace Windu talk about how they can't sense what the Sith are doing, but they're good enough at sensing things to be incredible at fighting with lightsabers. I think George Lucas should have chosen, like yeah should have should have made the choice between either the fact that they on the one hand can't sense what the Sith are doing but on the other hand they're such good fight like Mace Windu almost takes down Sidious like I mean I mean technically he does win the fight if Anakin hadn't helped Sidious that would have been that now on account of the political aspect, the let's hmm, I guess I did kind of say yeah, I did say that in the review, so I don't need to get to it here. Now the pop culture detective points out that at the end of the day, what drives Anakin Skywalker to lose control and become evil is that he uh, let's see. Right, yeah, the the fact that part of it is that he cares so much about the women in his life, his mother and his wife, you know, sadly there are a lot of stories where women are shown as a problem for men. The The fact that men have strong emotions for women lead to problems for them, and sadly this can mean that a number of people who hear and see these stories end up thinking it would be bad for them if they care a lot about certain women and a number of these men will treat women badly to avoid the situation or for punishing women for being harmful to men and honestly it wouldn't be that difficult to rewrite it so that his problem is what happens to himself or to men in his life not to women and no it wouldn't necessarily mean that he would have to be gay and if you were, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with being gay, but it could be his friends that he's worried about. You know, on the other hand, there's also uh, there's also men who worry about having positive emotions for other men. Yeah, the, probably the the best thing would be if the yeah if the big problem would be that he's scared that he will lose one or more objects that mean more to him than the people in his life do and that means that he ends up doing things that are selfish and the so the people who used to care him can't stand him anymore you know that is a, it's it's a problem today that so many people care more about objects than other people so it would send an important message and it among other things, it is a problem for a certain percentage of Star Wars fans who sent death threats to an actress in, who, you know, in Episode Eight who played a role that they didn't like. 
you know, empathy for her should mean more about how they feel about these movies. It's never okay to send death threats to anyone. In the final battle between Obi-Wan and Anakin, it is a problem that they look so similar, and I think it would have been a good idea to stick with the classics, give the bad guy a red lightsaber. That would have helped a lot. As much as... <laughs> as much as I love lightsabers, and definitely... I would definitely say that this movie has too many lightsabers, too much lightsaber action. It was already a problem in the Geonosis arena. While I will grant there is no one scene in this that has quite that many lightsabers at once, there are way too many scenes featuring lightsabers. There's too little breathing room in between them. And they, you know, they just, they go on for too long. Some of the action is so fast, you really appreciate how you can't really appreciate how good it is because it's moving so fast. In at least one of the trailers, when I, I want to say it's the teaser, the the what is it? Uh, almost two minute long teaser trailer, when Mace Windu and Dead Meat One, Two, and Three walk up to arrest the Chancellor, right after he says the line, Af "Are you threatening me, Master Jedi?" Right before he leaps up and starts attacking them. There's this sound, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but it sounds like something out of a horror movie. And every time I think of this movie, it's one of the first things I think of. When I saw the trailer in 2005, I could not wait to see that scene. And ultimately, it is a letdown. But I do really like that bit in the trailer. It's followed up by this, like, there's this short montage, really short clips from dramatic scenes. And there's this, like, war drum playing. Now, I really appreciate that the climactic action scenes have symbolism, metaphor, have something to say. Now, the original Matrix movie, before we get the answers, we're, we have a lot of questions at the start of the movie, and it's very intellectually stimulating. We're looking forward to getting the answers, and... You know, once we do get the answers, we we feel satisfied. I'll, I'll grant that there are questions that the movies don't answer, but I think there are, they tend to be questions that we don't need to know the answers for for that. So I don't think that the prequels 100% had to explain these concepts early on, but I think it's a mistake that by the end of Episode 3, we still have a lot of important questions that we don't know the answers to. Too many questions, too many concepts that we haven't had explained to us well enough. You know, at the end, Anakin Skywalker is very badly burnt, and you know he he needs serious medical attention. So they put him into the suit, which helps with his scorched lungs. One of the robots that built the suit explains to Sidious, he's in a really bad state. He can't breathe without oxygen. What did he get his medical degree on the internet? And that brings us to the end. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video to watch on this screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on movie, and one talking about the most recent of the current Disney Plus MCU show, these days that is Hawkeye. Recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoy watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.